first deadline in the conservative leadership race has barely come and gone, but we're already just three weeks away from the second and final deadline. Eight candidates passed the first hurdle. They submitted 1,000 signatures, a $25,000 fee, and got approval from the leadership's organizing committee. They have until March 25th now to submit a further 2,000 signatures and $275,000. Both Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole have handed all of that in, and they're considered, quote, verified candidates. Jim Carajalios is a conservative leadership hopeful. He joins us now from Toronto. Hi, Mr. Carajalios. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Vashi. Thanks for having me. In preparation for the interview, I was looking through a lot of your leadership materials, and what jumped out at me was that you've criticized uh, quite often and consistently what you call the red Tory establishment, and you've insisted that you're going to be an alternative. What do you mean by that term, red Tory establishment? Well, we've got a race here that's a red Tory coronation uh, where the rules are being set up in a quick race for, to the advantage of Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay. And if anyone follows Ontario politics and the backroom boys uh, running conservative politics in Ontario, there's a disconnect between the establishment and conservative voters and conservative party members. And I ran, I'm getting in this race because we need a fighter to take on Justin Trudeau and we need a blue conservative who's not part of the red Tory establishment, who's not out of touch with conservative voters and voters in Canada uh, to beat Justin Trudeau. And that's why I'm in this race. Uh, it's going to be a big challenge to get past the March 25th hurdle of $300,000 in donations. But we've got a lot of support across the country, over 180 ridings, signatures and counting. We're quickly approaching the 3,000. And we're in this race to offer conservative voters what they want, which is a real conservative in this race that's going to represent the grassroots. And it's going to clean up politics, not only in the Conservative Party, but in Ottawa, and the message to the conservative establishment and the liberal establishment will be clear from my race. Are you going to make that $300,000? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a new thing in Canadian politics to see such a high threshold just to get your name on the ballot. Um, we're quickly uh, raising money. My fear is we may run out of time because there's only three weeks left. If it was signatures and votes and endorsements, uh, I'd be on the final ballot. But it would be a real shame in this race if there are only two candidates, Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole, both red Tories on the ballot, and there will be a lot, a lot of unhappy Conservative Party members if that's the case. How far are you from 300,000? Well, look, uh, you're asking me to give you the details. <laughs> I uh, sure am. <laughs> if, if any of the watchers want to donate, uh, it's going well. We're getting a lot of support. We could always use more donations. It's a shame that you've got to buy your way onto a ballot in a democratic process. I've always been for open and public elections, whether those be nominations, leadership races, and obviously in general elections. This is a weird one where we've got a $300,000 buy-in in a very short period of time. Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay's campaigns, you know, they had one hand was the knife that they plunged in Andrew Shear's back, and in the other hand, they were collecting checks on Bay Street to get in this race. For a grassroots conservative that's from the outside, that's not there part of the a, establishment, respect, there is very a, there difficult is a limit to, get in to the, the donations, though, right? Uh, 1625, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, so that's not necessarily only Bay Street, to be fair to them. Well, I don't know, you'd have to ask them, but uh, you, you see their teams made up of uh, insiders on Bay Street. It's not really hard to go up and down Bay Street a couple of times. You can pick up quite a few checks. If you're from the outside, though, you're not well connected, you're not the son of a former politician as uh, Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole are, it's, it's, it's a lot tougher. Even logistically, to get the money from all over Canada, it's a tough thing to do in three weeks. Let me ask you from a policy perspective. If you're saying that they're the same, they're red Tories, how, what kind of policies are going to differentiate you from them? I'd start, for example, on uh, you're, you're against the carbon tax. I read a lot about that in your material. They're all saying that they're against the carbon tax, too. So how will you distinguish yourself from them on a policy basis? Well, you know my hist history, Vashi, if you read up on me. I started the Axe the Carbon Tax campaign, advocated for that in Ontario. I advocated against ballot box stuffing in internal party races. Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole back then were fine promoting Patrick Brown and his carbon tax plan. Uh, after I joined the race, they said, finally, they came around to remembering there's a carbon tax question in our party. But it's not just about the carbon tax. We also have to clean up government. We have to get Canada out of the Paris Accord. I'm the only candidate in this race from Peter McKay, Aaron O'Toole, Leslie Lewis, Marilyn Gladue, Derek Sloan. No one's calling to get out of the Paris Accord. I was the first candidate in this race to say we've got to put, end, put an end to the blockades we're seeing across the country uh, that are shutting down our economy by inserting in the criminal code legislation that says if you want to target infrastructure projects and shut them down, that's a crime. 
Aaron O'Toole jumped on that bandwagon five hours Isn't later. Isn't it already a crime? Uh, no, it's illegal based on certain statutes, but it needs to be inserted in the criminal code, and Aaron O'Toole agrees. Is that so an those are Those are two okay. of the issues uh, that I've released. I'm releasing policies uh, every week, uh, and we're going to have policies on cleaning up politics in this country and cleaning up government. Let me circle back to the Paris Accord. Uh, are you worried by removing, like, what is the point in removing us from the Paris Accord? Aren't those targets, targets that should be there? Shouldn't we be trying to reduce carbon emissions in this country? Well, some conservative politicians have had tried to have it both ways uh, in this country, where on the one hand, they want to tell voters they're against the carbon tax. And you'll see politicians that switch their stance on that because of the movement of the Axe, the carbon tax campaign and others. And then at the same time, they want to say they're for the Paris Accord. I got involved in this party when Stephen Harper took a principal stand against the Kyoto Accord, which was the predecessor or the preceding document to the Paris Accord. If you're for the Paris Accord, you are in favor of carbon taxes. You are in favor of putting a price on carbon. And that is an impact on Canadian sovereignty that is going to drive jobs out of Canada, that is going to also hinder our ability to develop our economy further and we need a strong western based economy and the conservative party has a strong western foundation and for all those reasons we need to get out of the paris accord so so let me let me get this straight though if you remove canada from the paris accord are you in favor of reducing emissions in this country or are you saying that you will 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 sort of abdicate yourself from that goal every uh, industry in canada are leaders on environmental standards and reducing emissions they're way ahead of government on this every barrel of oil that stays in the ground in canada is worse for the environment because it means extraction of a barrel of oil in another country probably with poor environmental standards uh, and we are leaders in industry in this, and we have to get back to an environmental plan that is drill, drill, build pipelines from coast to coast, and on the question of climate change, we need to adapt to protect our citizens. Do you believe in climate change, and do you believe that human activity is contributing to it? There's plenty of science that shows climate change is occurring. There's science that shows uh, man contributes to it, and the key obligation of government is to adapt and manage it and protect its citizens. But when you, but let me take you on that point, challenge you for a second, because if you're adapting, I mean, it costs money to mitigate the effects of climate change, right? The Insurance Bureau of Canada, for example, says Canadian insurers are now facing claims of natural catastrophes, floods, forest fires, other extreme weather events of approximately $1 billion annually. That's up from $400 million annually in previous decades. So you know, from a fiscally conservative point of view, if you're going to stop doing things that reduce carbon emissions in this country at the federal level, you're going to pay a lot more to mitigate the effects we, of we are We are not achieving the targets in the Paris Accord. We are spending money and wasting time uh, to accomplish targets that we are not meeting and that international players are not meeting. And industry is leading on environmental standards and reducing emissions. And the key thing is, if if the climate is changing and there's an impact on our citizens, we have to quickly adapt because it's too risky to play around with targets and legislation and global legislation that, that we're not going to achieve. Uh, and then after we tax uh, industry and tax Canadians across the country, we're going to say, well, we did our best, but the international community didn't catch up. And so, you know, uh, it, it didn't really work out. But what does uh, adapt mean when yeah, you say plenty, adapt? What does that mean? Well, for starters, we need to get, we need to develop better infrastructure. We need to uh, have the resources and also the guidance from the government to ensure that people are living in areas where when the climate is changing, they're not living in floodplains. They are not living in vulnerable areas where they have the assistance from government when they're impacted by the change of climate um, that, uh, that, that costs they, a that, lot of money. Well, that is the reality of the situation because we're not meeting the targets. So it's not, it's dishonest of politicians. It's dishonest of Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay to say it would be nice to stay in the Paris Accord because those are aspirational targets when they know we are not achieving those targets. And Justin Trudeau knows that we are not achieving those targets. But is it not and worth trying then? If you're not going to meet the targets, it's not even worth trying to reduce no. emissions? What is important is that we try to protect our citizens, not sugarcoat it and say we've signed the Paris Accord, so we've done our job on the environment, 
And it really is a gloss over of the entire environmental portfolio because politicians use it as a backup plan to say, I've done my part, I've signed the Paris Accord, we're putting a carbon tax in and that's all there is to it. So uh, you know it's a global problem or a global question what we're talking about here and Canada contributes 1%. And it's interesting that recently a study was shown that in the United States where they don't have a carbon tax, they're actually reducing emissions at a faster rate uh, than we are. Uh, so adaptation has to be a key point of the analysis and it's being completely ignored. Okay, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time. But thank you so much for your time, Mr. Carajalios. Appreciate it. Thank you. It. I look forward to stopping the Red Tory coronation.